Well, good morning, everyone. A warm welcome to each one of you joining us here in the meeting house for our worship service this morning. And indeed, if you're also joining us online, we want to make you warmly welcome, whether that's live right now or later as you watch on YouTube. Uh, again, uh, if any are visiting with us this morning, we want to make you warmly welcome in our midst as we gather. We have a, a number of announcements, uh, and I suppose I, maybe we'll begin with the one that I normally end with because it's relevant to what comes next. Uh, it is with great sadness uh, today that we report the death of one of our senior members of the congregation, Mrs. Lily Vance. Lily has been, as some of you will know, for the last three years in Drabersfield Nursing Home, and she passed away peacefully on uh, the early hours of Thursday morning. Uh, so we... Uh, uh, rather Friday morning, sorry, the early hours of, early hours of Friday morning. And uh, we gather there for this afternoon for a service of thanksgiving for her life, uh, which will take place here in the meeting house at two o'clock. Uh, and I know the family will be arriving uh, so on from about a quarter past one. So uh, obviously w w when we finish the service today, and I'll try to be finished a little bit sharper, uh, we, we do need to vacate the, the, the premises just for a short time to allow them to be fogged with the fogging machine as we do between congregations. We're still following these COVID protocols. So for that reason, we need to, to leave for a period of time before uh, we move on to the, the, the later service. But we do want to extend uh, to uh, Christine and Raymond, obviously are members of our congregation, to John and Kathleen, and, and indeed to uh, Lily's other daughter, uh, Margaret, our love, our sympathy, and our prayers as a congregation at this time of sadness and loss. Because many of us are involved really from, from right now this morning through the whole afternoon, we've decided just on this occasion to not hold our evening service tonight uh, in the normal way. However, uh, there has been uh, over the past couple of Sundays the opportunity to vote or at least to submit uh, nominations in our process for selecting new ruling elders. Today was to be the final day of that and it will be the final day of it. Uh, but if you've not brought your voting paper this evening or you'd or sorry this morning and you'd planned to bring it this evening we will open the church just for a short period of time just for about 15 minutes from 6 15 through to what would have been the normal start of service time at half past six uh, and you can if you haven't your voting paper this morning you can return it then in the box or alternatively indeed if you remember who it is you voted for you're voting for and you want to take a fresh sheet of paper, a fresh little form, and fill it out and, and, and return it after the service this morning. You can do that. Um, but this will be the final day for submitting nominations for our new uh, election of elders. And then the Kirk session will take that process further, further another step tomorrow evening when they meet at eight o'clock in the old manse. There is no midweek meeting here uh, this incoming week, and the the, 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 the the announcement there about growth groups on Wednesday night is is a mistake, and that's just a carryover from last week's announcement sheet, actually. But you'll see the midweek this week. Uh, we're invited to go to First Stewartstown uh, to a special midweek they're holding. They have the privilege of having visiting uh, Alistair Torrens, who is principal of the Evangelical Reformed Seminary of Ukraine uh, in Kiev, and obviously bearing in mind all that's happening in that country at the present time, we want to get as many of our folk along to, to hear about that. And uh, so we encourage you to go along to First Stewartstown on Wednesday evening at 8. And to remember, there will be an offering taken, at least a retiring offering for the, the work of the seminary on that occasion. Uh, during the incoming week, I think that's most that needs highlighted. Next Lord's Day, we are back to our pattern of services at 11.30 and 6.30. However, do remember that British summertime begins next weekend, so an hour less in bed in the morning of Sunday. There's a couple of sign-up sheets that are about the church, either here at the, at the doors as you leave here or in the porch. And that's for two, two quite different things. One is we're hoping to do some Easter distribution of literature and so on and invitations ahead of Easter. We're trying to sign people up for that just now. So if you can help with that, please do sign on the sheet. And the other sign up then is for the PW who are hoping to hold a dinner on Tuesday the 12th of April in the Royal Hotel and their sign up sheet is available also uh, for those who might want to come or indeed to bring friends along to that dinner. Uh, with the retiring offering we've made available for the Ukraine appeal, the Presbyterian Church's Ukraine appeal, we'll keep that open for one more week. So that will conclude next uh, Sunday 
and we thank those who already have been contributing generously to that. I think that's probably all of the announcements that I need to highlight. The rest of them you can read, and uh, as they apply to you, you can respond to them. But we're going to worship the Lord just now, and we hear the words of Psalm 145, where the psalmist writes, I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. Oh, on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. Well, despite still having the masks, uh, we're going to encourage you to sing aloud just now in the opening praise. Uh, which reminds us of the Lord who is not only the risen Lord, but the ascended Lord and the one who's coming again. He's coming on the clouds, kings and kingdoms will bow down and every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise. Sam will lead us in this. Every day will bow 
bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before him. Okay, let's come to God's throne of grace in prayer. Let us pray together. Our great and almighty God, we have declared your praises as your people have done in every generation. We've heard the words of the psalmist this morning extolling your greatness, reminding us that your greatness is unsearchable and that every generation has found you to be the same one who glorious in your majesty and power and in the might of your awesome deeds. And that's what we experience, O oh God, when we know your work in our own hearts, transforming us from people who ran away from you and he- tried to hide from you and to res- resist your will in our sinfulness. And you utterly changed the hearts of people here who can testify to a- an experience of new birth by the Holy Spirit. Only the power of God could have done this within us. For we would have never chosen you in our fallenness. But the scripture reminds us you're a God who's gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And you don't simply will that the sinner would perish in their sin, but rather that they would turn in repentance to you. We thank you, Lord, for the grace that sought us many of us out and changed us and brought us to new life in Jesus. Maybe the Spirit of God today continues to do that work of conviction of sin and of calling upon someone's heart. We pray that today they would hear and answer the call of the Lord Jesus Christ and that miracle of new birth would become a reality for them. And then, Lord, as believing people, many of us have come to crisis times in our lives when we've known that The issues facing us were way, way beyond anything we were able to deal with. They were far too hard, too overwhelming for us. And we had to remind ourselves then that that nothing is too hard for God. We came and we called upon your name and we thank you, Lord God, for the many times you heard and answered our prayers and showed your almighty power to change a situation that humanly was beyond our ability. Lord, we praise you and thank you for the great and awesome things you have done alongside the common, simple, everyday things you do. Because when you taught your disciples to pray, you told them to ask you daily for their daily bread, for the basic necessities of life. And we thank you for those things too this morning because we don't take them for granted when we see that others across our world today starve for lack of food. Others are caught up in situations of of conflict. Others flee as refugees and maybe wonder where their income or their food will come from in days to come. So for the awesome, great answers to prayer and for the simple answers to prayer day and daily, we praise you and thank you, O God, and pray you'll give us grateful hearts and forgive us for the times when we've just been too self-centered even to call upon your name or even to ask you for the things that you would provide gladly to us. Forgive our foolishness in that regard and bring us humbly to walk before you and bow before you in our great need every day, knowing you're a God of abundant grace and will always provide every one of our needs out of your riches in Christ Jesus. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we're going to turn to our Bibles this morning, and we are back in Genesis, but I want to go for the guys at the back, first of all, to that second reading, maybe to the one uh, from uh, uh, Second Corinthians. It's a shorter reading just now. Second Corinthians chapter 4, and we'll read this, and maybe we'll see some of the connection then with Genesis when we read it later on. We'll read the Genesis reading later in the service. So 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4. And there we're going to read the first six verses. 2 Corinthians 4, 1 to 6. Sorry for catching you guys on the hop (laughs) by changing the, the order. Here we are. This is God's word. 
that Paul is writing here. He says, therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We end there and know God will bless the reading of his precious word. Now, boys and girls, a wee word for you this morning. I asked you to come up last week. I'll not do that this morning because Keith had interesting things to show you this morning. I have things to show you, but they're all going to pop up on the screen. So you can probably stay where you are this morning and listen uh, while I speak to you. But what we've been doing, remember, for a few weeks, boys and girls, we were thinking about the ways in which Jesus Christ, God's Son, has great power. Remember, he had power to speak to a storm and say to the storm, be still, be quiet. And the storm stopped. He had even power when a little girl had died because she was very ill to bring her back to life again. Then there was that crazy, crazy man who was full of devils and demons who nobody could possibly help. Everybody had tried to do something to help him, but nothing could help except when he met Jesus, and Jesus chased the demons away. Jesus has power over the devil. The last time I spoke to you, we thought about how Jesus had power over people's great need because on that occasion, some people, in fact, a very large number of people were hungry. People who've been following Jesus all day, wanting to hear his teaching, wanting to see his miracles. And it came the evening and there was no food for them except a, a little boy's lunchbox. But when Jesus took the little loaves, five of them, and two fish, and asked God's blessing, then he was able to feed 5,000 people. So last, this is the last thing today about the power that Jesus has. I'm going to ask you a question first of all. Every one of you can see me this morning and you can see up on the screen and you can see all around you, but what would it be like if you couldn't see anything? In fact, if you'd never been able to see anything, if you were blind, what kind of things, if someone was blind and they couldn't see at all, what kind of things would be really difficult to do? Hmm? If you couldn't see, what? Well, yeah, Christopher. You couldn't, see, you couldn't see very well to walk. That's right, because it's okay walking now. But if I close my eyes and want to walk, oh, I would be in big trouble because the edge of the platform somewhere here, and the next thing I would know, I would be falling on the ground because I wouldn't see where the step was. Anything else, Caleb? Um, eating. Eating. We don't know where the food is. We don't know where the food is. <laughs> but you might find it. Once you get your fork out it, you might find it when you get your mouth. Yeah, that's right. Anything else would be really difficult? Yes, yeah, shout out. Crossing the road, exactly, because you know if you're told, I don't know what it's like today, but when I was at your size, your age, the people said to me, you come to the edge of the road and you're going to cross, you have to look right, then you have to look left, then you have to look right again to check there's no traffic coming. And only if it's safe and there's no traffic can you cross the road. So all sorts of things. And yeah, has anybody watched the Winter Olympics recently when they were on TV? Did anybody see those people skiing who couldn't see? They were almost blind or almost blind, and yet they were able to ski at high speed, kind of by, by, often by following somebody else who was going down the ski slope ahead of them, telling them where to turn and where to and how, you know, where, where there's a 
where there was a turn coming up. It was amazing. In fact, it is completely amazing today what people can do who can't see because there's all kinds of things that make that are able to help them. Now, the story this morning is about a man who, in the Bible, whom Jesus met, and he couldn't see. In fact, uh, here he is with a stick, and um, he's trying to find his way. He's trying to walk along the road, but when a blind person has a stick like this, the reason they have a stick is because if they leave the stick back and forward and something's in their way, the stick hits against it rather than them hitting against it. When they come maybe to the steps here, they can feel with the stick where the step is, and they know when to step down. So here he is. And this man's name is, is Bartimaeus. Now, put that picture back up again, because not only did Bartimaeus have a stick, but he had, we'll move the next picture here, because he had this other thing as well. He had a bowl. Now, it wasn't a bowl probably, well, maybe he did eat from it at times, I don't know. But one of the things he had a bowl for was to beg for money. Because one of the things that it is difficult to do when you can't see anything, it's difficult to do the kind of ordinary jobs that other people do. Now, today, again, with all sorts of audio things to help blind people and all sorts, and, and there's a special kind of writing called Braille uh, that, that blind people can read. Today, there's lots of things people can do who cannot see. But back in Jesus' day, if you were blind as Bartimaeus had been all of his life, you couldn't find a job, you couldn't work, and often what blind people did was they, they, they held out a bowl and as people were going past, they begged them to give them money. And so this is what happened uh, in Bartimaeus' life. But one day, he heard someone was coming to his town where he lived. He'd heard people talking about this person. And he heard that this person was really, really special. The person, of course, was Jesus. Because Bartimaeus had heard the stories about how uh, Jesus uh, was able to heal people. Now, we'll flick down the, 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 the pictures a little bit here till we see Bartimaeus. Uh, first of all, there he is sitting beside the road with his hand on his bow. And he heard this man, Jesus, who could heal people, who could make people walk who were lame, who could make people see who were blind. He's coming to my town. I want to meet him. Except Bartimaeus, of course, couldn't see where Jesus was. But when the crowd came along, and when he thought that Jesus was near, he began to shout. And he began to shout out, Jesus, son of David, help me, have mercy on me. And he shouted and shouted. But some of the people, and there's a rather angry lady there, she's pointing her finger at him, and she's telling him, be quiet. Don't make such a fuss. Don't stop all your shouting. But Bartimaeus just kept on shouting. Son of David, Jesus, help me, have mercy on me. And the great thing is Jesus stopped with him. And Jesus stopped, and he said to the people, don't chase them away. Bring them here. And they, they came along to Bartimaeus and said, come on, come on, come on, come. Jesus wants to see you. And Jesus asked him a very simple question. He said, what do you want me to do for you? Well, what do you think his answer was? Yeah, Christopher, help me see again. I've never been able to see. Give me sight. I want to recover my sight. I want to be able to see like everybody else. And again, here's what Jesus had did. It was just like when he stopped the storm, Jesus just had to say a few words. He said to, Bar to, to Bartimaeus, go on your way. Your faith has made you well again. And guess what? His sight came back and he could see Jesus. And the Bible tells us he followed Jesus along the road. He's very pleased, isn't he? He's very excited. And he wanted to follow Jesus along the way. But you know, here's the interesting thing about, about Bartimaeus. Even before he could ever see Jesus with his eyes, with his ears, he'd heard the good news about Jesus, that Jesus changed people's lives. He'd heard with his ears the good news that Jesus was able to heal and to rescue people. 
And in his heart, he believed in Jesus. He believed in the power of Jesus to completely change his life. And so when he shouted out to Jesus, he wasn't just making a big noise. That's what the other people thought. The other people thought, this guy's just shouting and screaming. He's making a fuss. But as far as Bartimaeus was concerned, he was asking Jesus with faith in his heart to come and help him and completely change his life. And boys and girls, that's what we always must remember. For anybody who calls on Jesus Christ with real faith and trusting in him to help them, Jesus will answer their prayers. There's a little verse in the Bible that says that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That just means they'd be rescued. Now, of course, it means we'd be rescued from sin that would destroy us and take us to hell. But it also means that in all kinds of other ways where we need Jesus' help, if we can call upon him, shout out to him, cry out to him, pray to him, he's willing to hear us and to answer our prayers and to help us and to completely change our lives. So that's Jesus' power over blindness, over somebody who couldn't see, to give them a totally new life. Let's pray together, boys and girls, when we think about that before we sing. Lord Jesus, thank you for the way you healed Bartimaeus because he trusted you and called upon your name. Thank you that you can change our lives and help us in our times of need when we call upon you in faith. We're thankful, most of us here, that we can see well and that we're able to enjoy so many good things in life. But we know, Lord, it would be possible to see all the things in the world and yet fail to see that you love us. It would be possible to see and enjoy lots of things and miss the promise of eternal life that you give. So help us, everyone, to trust in Jesus, to call upon him as our Lord and our Savior. In his name we pray. Amen. Now, we're going to sing Sam again, another song uh, that is a, asking God to do for our hearts what he did for, Jesus, for, for Bartimaeus. Open the eyes of my heart, we're saying to Jesus, because I want to see you.
as you go off to Children's Church just now. Okay. Okay, let's just come to the Lord in prayer again. Just now we're going to uh, obviously remember uh, the family of Mrs. Vance and their time of bereavement. And of course then that huge, ongoing, wide-scale loss of life that we see on our television screens every day is unfolding still in Ukraine. And uh, we were reminding folks just last Sunday evening to remember that when one trouble spot in the world hits the headlines and is there, it doesn't mean there's no trouble anywhere else. Other places are still extremely difficult in the midst of war and indeed for God's people sometimes very difficult in the midst of persecution. So we remember them too. Let's also remember Maud, who is, we trust now, I've heard no news from Maud since she went to Melita, nothing new to report in that regard, but we trust that no news is good news and that she's continuing to get on well there. So we remember her in prayer also. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we just take these moments to lift our hearts in prayer to intercede for the needs of others, knowing that you will hear and answer the prayer that's offered in faith. We remember our, our sister Maud and bless you, Lord, for the work you have given her to do over these few weeks in Melita, praying at this time you'll keep her well and strong and healthy, uh, free, for example, from the, the threat of malaria that has often curtailed her work in the past, I'm praying that she may know grace and strength for every day and wisdom in making decisions and in using her time well and that this will prove a really fruitful time of ministry and encouragement for her. Lord, will you continue to abide with her and those in the church there in Melita this Lord's Day as already they will have gathered for worship and as they will continue then into this incoming week, lots of other good work in the Bible school, in the hospital, in the day school, that you will bless and prosper that work each and every day. We thank you, Lord, that at this time, the war that in the past has ravaged that part of Congo is, has abated, at least from that area, and that daily life and, uh, of homes and families is able to go on ahead, and yet we realize there are other parts of the world where this is manifestly not the case. We think of so many people in Ukraine this morning who have spent another night sheltering from the bombs, especially the people in Mariupol, Lord, who seem to be just trapped there. We remember them very much, uh, especially those maybe that were stuck in the basement of that theater and unable to escape from it when there was fighting in the streets. Lord, these stories come to our, 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 our television screens every day and we, we, we shudder to think what it would be like to be in that situation, but we pray for your deliverance of this nation from the time of war that has come upon us and that the Russian forces would draw back from this continual campaign of bombardment and that your people especially and indeed all the peace-loving people of Ukraine would be able to have something of normal life restored and the refugee people able quite soon to return home. But as we continue to bring offerings for that relief, we pray that you will bless and prosper that work of helping others in their time of dire need. And we don't forget, Lord, that this is just one war story. There are other parts of the world where maybe not this full-scale war, but that kind of guerrilla warfare is ongoing. We know that there, there's a, a, a terrorist warfare. We know that in parts of sub-Saharan Africa, that continues day and daily. We know that in Yemen, there's been a long-running, brutal war for years. We pray your mercy upon people there who suffer greatly because of it. Uh, we don't see into the situation each day. We just hear occasionally of the, of the great loss of life and the great brokenness of heart and the great uh, tragedy of, of people's lives ruined 
by conflict. Lord, have mercy, we pray, in that situation also. And then, Lord, we come into the needs of our own church family, very much remembering today uh, the family of Mrs. Vance. And thanking you, Lord, for her and for her testimony of Christ as Savior and Lord, and for the witness she bore, and the service she gave in the life of this congregation over many years. We do pray, though, at this time for John and Margaret and Christine especially, and indeed for, for grandchildren and great-grandchildren also. We just pray, Lord God, in your mercy to help them and comfort them, and especially give them strength in these next few hours as they will come here for this time of service of thanksgiving. May that indeed not just be a time of grief, but a time of gladness for them as they reflect upon the blessings that her life brought to them and then the knowledge that she has gone home to be with Jesus and is there in heaven alive forevermore. We remember also, Lord, those who've been in hospital this week from our congregation, who've had surgery and are now recovering. We pray your help and healing for them. For others who've got maybe encouraging results from tests and then others who wait anxiously for the outcome that's yet unknown. Come those to those folk, Lord, in need and help them and strengthen them and provide for them at this time. We pray too, Lord, that for each one of us who just silently would tell you are the, the burdens of our own hearts now, however, however great those burdens are, help us to know that when we've spread them out before the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, we will not be left without a helper. But we have one who loves us, who gave himself for us, and who's promised to hear the prayers that his people offer in faith and to answer even beyond our expectations. Hear us as we call upon you now. And grant to us good answers to prayer and thankful hearts when we see what the hand of God has done. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, let's turn back to our Bibles now. We will read once more <laughs> some of these opening, opening verses of Genesis 1. I think we read a, this section last week, but we'll read it again, or two weeks ago rather. So let's read it again this morning from verses 1 to 27 of Genesis chapter 1. This is the word of God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And so it was so. God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years and let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. 
And God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures and let the birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and the livestock according to their kinds and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was so. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Amen. We know God again will bless the reading of his infallible word. Let's sing once more and then we'll come to the message of the word. This time our song is this, my worth is not what I own. Father, we have had the privilege of reading your word and can do so any day, but we pray now as we hear its message that you will give understanding to our hearts 
of what the scriptures say to us and how they speak to us personally. In Jesus' name, amen. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Those opening words of the Bible have been the focus of our thinking now over a couple of Sunday mornings as we began to look at the book of Genesis. And as we return again to Genesis 1 this morning, my question at the outset is this. Do the details matter? Because while most Christians accept the fundamental idea of God as the creator of the world, indeed of the whole universe, there is, as we saw last time, a number of differing views as to exactly what they mean by that. Many Christians like myself are happy with reading the Bible plainly and straightforwardly and accepting the fact that God created the universe and specifically the world we live in in the space of six literal 24-hour days. Others, however, are troubled as to how they will square that idea with popular accepted theories of evolution, which dominate not just the scientific world, but secular Western society in general, and have a completely different way of looking at the origins of the universe. And so we saw last time that there's those who've tried to match up somehow the biblical story of creation and the so-called theory of evolution. We looked at a couple of those ideas the last time, the the so-called gap theory that suggests, in actual fact, there is a a, a non-known length of time between Genesis 1 verse 1 and Genesis 1 verse 2, a huge gap that somehow will account for the very old age of the earth that evolution would suggest. Another was the day-age theory that says when you read of six days of creation, really the Bible means six extremely long periods of time, six long eras. And that, again, allows you to fit in the concept of evolution. We also saw that there was a problem with that because the order of things as set out in the biblical record of creation doesn't really match up with what the secular theories of evolution would suggest that the two don't really fit together. And the other thing was this, that it doesn't really square with the teaching of New Testament scripture, especially Romans chapter 5, because Romans chapter 5 says very plainly that death does not enter into the world we live in until there is human sin. Sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. If that is true, There cannot have been life and death happening for millions of years beforehand. So fundamental details do matter when we think about creation. As do also the details that are included here in Genesis chapter 1 regarding each separate day of creation. To be honest, we could probably be in this chapter for several weeks if we wanted to. I don't want that to happen I want one more look at it this morning, at least the, most of the, 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 the verses we read. We'll, we'll give it in one go. And to highlight some important things, the first thing I want you to notice this morning is this, that in creation, God brings order out of disorder. And that's what you see really as you move from verse 2 of Genesis 1 into verses 3 and following. Verse 2 says, the earth was without form and void. This is how God first created. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. The Spirit of God was about to do something else. So in the first instance, God creates formless matter or elements or whatever it is, out of which he will make everything else. And each act of God in each day of creation is God giving form to that which began as something that was formless. God giving order to that which was previously chaos or, chaos or disorder. And his first act of creation is to bring light 
out of darkness. Verse 3, God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now, it's actually three days later, on day four of creation, that God goes further, and he designates this source of light particularly to the heavenly bodies that he creates, the sun and the billions of stars that are in the universe. And of course, also he highlights the, the light of the moon, but the light of the moon, of course, is simply the reflected light of the sun. But right at the outset of creation, God establishes these concepts of light and darkness, and specifically of day and of night. Verses 4 and 5, we read that God saw that the light was good. God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. Here is God not only separating light and darkness, but also creating for this world the measure of time. Before the world was created, time did not exist. And when the world ends, and then the new heaven and the new earth, there will be no longer any time as we know it at present. God creates the measure of time, of day and night, on a regular basis. And in fact, he later tells us when he forms the, the, the heavenly bodies that they are part of his whole plan of creating days and years and, and months and seasons and so on. Uh, that order, once again, the order, the passage of time. And this little phrase about the measure of time keeps getting repeated each day of creation as it passes. It says there was evening and there was morning the first day. There was evening, there was morning the second day. There was evening, there was morning the third day, and so on. But back to our main point for a moment, that in creation, God brings order out of disorder. That's significant not only in creation, but also as a pattern that unfolds in the history of the world. In human history, God is a God of order who creates that which is good and that which is beautiful. But the impact of human sin in human history seeks to undo all of that. When humans rebel against God and against God's authority, the result is disorder brought into the good world that God has created. So, for example, when you see what we've watched these past three weeks and more in, in Ukraine, you see the outbreak of war and all the, the chaos and all the suffering it inflicts upon a society, you see something that is running against the good rule of God in the world. And it's the devil trying to bring disorder where God wants order. When human greed and corruption lead to economic collapse and there is chaos in the world markets and there's a massive recession and people are losing jobs and all that stuff, here again you have the disorder of human sin impacting very painfully on the good world and the blessings that God has created for us. And we could go on giving other examples. Even the fact that we live in a world where we experience what are called natural disasters, even that is ultimately the result of a world that has become disordered because of human sin and is therefore a world under God's judgment. The other thing that's worth noting at this point is the significance in Scripture of light and darkness. Not just this physical difference between day and night, but also how Scripture represents this, uses these things to represent the spiritual difference between what God's salvation does in the world and what human sin does in the world. In the Bible, Human beings in their sin are portrayed as being in spiritual darkness. But when God sends his son to be the savior of the world, he sends one who brings light into darkness. 
And so we read at Christmas time Isaiah's famous prophecy, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them a light has dawned. And Jesus himself then proclaims in John chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The Apostle Paul takes that further because in our Bible reading in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, there Paul describes what happens when God brings salvation into a person's life. When God takes away the spiritual blindness that the devil and sin has put there, here's what he says. God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And what you've got there, of course, as you can see, is a reference right back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, where God said, let there be light shining out of the darkness. It's a picture of what God would also do in the human heart in his plan of salvation. And so, in fact, in the next chapter of Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians 5 this time, when Paul, Paul talks about a person receiving Christ as their Savior. He says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. That's exactly what God's salvation is about. It is about God spiritually recreating the individual so that they are liberated from the darkness of sin and they are given a new life. To use Jesus' words, it is being born again. And fundamentally, that is what needs to happen in your life and in mine if we are to be made right with God. We need the light of God to shine into the darkness of our hearts where sin dwells and to drive it out and to make us new people. And where are you and I going to find the light of God? The answer is that we find the light of God in the Word of God. In Psalm 119, verse 130, the psalmist writes this. He says, the unfolding or the entrance of your words gives light. That's where people get light from to dispel the spiritual darkness through hearing and heeding and obeying the word of God. And again, there's a certain link there back to what's happening in Genesis 1. Because every time we read of some new aspect of God's creation, these same words keep cropping up. And God said. And God said. Every time you hear that of a new thing being created on days one to six of creation, it is because God spoke. Verse 3, 6, 9, 11, 14, 20, and 24. There it is. Look at them up for yourself. But I'll read a few of them. God says it seven times. He says in verse 3, let there be, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Verse 11, God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit, fruit, trees bearing fruit. Verse 20, God said, let the water swarm with swarms of living creatures. Let the birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. Verse 24, let the earth bring forth, said God living creatures according to their kinds. That's the miracle of God's creation. God's creation is a miracle. It's not some evolutionary myth. It is God's creative work, creative word at work. It's not millions of years of evolution from one thing to another. God speaks and it happens. God speaks and it is done. The other thing we should note in these verses is this, it is God's satisfaction with creation. Five times we encounter this repeated phrase in verses 10, 12, 18, 21, and 25, and God saw that it, what he had made, was good. 
In fact, when his work of creation is completed at the end of the sixth day, we read in verse 31, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. You see, there is no sense in Genesis 1 of a, a work in progress that needs to evolve into something better or something more complete. There's no sense in Genesis 1 of needing to evolve from some primitive form of life into some advanced form of life. God's work of creation is a work which satisfies him as something good when he has simply spoken it into being. Notice also that when God creates both plant life and animal life, he does so with the ability to reproduce itself in a God-ordained cycle of life. So we read in verse 11, for example, when we read there that God created plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed. When he creates the sea life and the bird life, it's exactly the same in verse 22. Because God says to them, when he's created the birds and he's created the, the, the ocean swarming with life, he says to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. Animal life is being made by God's design and by God's command with the ability to reproduce by God's design. So here, if you're ever asked that age-old question, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Which was it? The chicken, obviously, from Genesis 1. The chicken came first. Because God made birds with the ability to reproduce and lay and fertilize eggs. But here's a question people might well ask. Did God create absolutely all the animals and birds and fish and insects and so on all at the beginning? Or is it not the case, is it not plainly obvious that many new breeds and variants of animals have developed over the years, some either by what seem to be natural processes and others, of course, in the realm of farming and so on, uh, and horticulture through deliberate cross-breeding? And the answer to that is pretty straightforward. Of course, that's what happens. I think we can say clearly that God has allowed for genetic variation within a genus or a species of animal or plant life. Something we can see within fairly recent history and of course something that we can be part of if you're a horticulturist or, 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 or involved in, in animal reproduction by cross-pollination of plants, by cross-breeding of animals, you, you produce something that seems different and new. I'm not a biologist, please forgive me if I get the terms, the technical terms wrong. I hated biology at school. I loved chemistry, but not, never did biology to any, any length. Probably it shows some of you are saying. But in all this, the key words in Genesis 1 that are repeated over and over again are this, that God created these things, listen, according to its kind. According to its kind. Verse 12, the earth brought forth, veg, brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their kinds and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed according to its kind. The same of the birds and fish in, in verse 21 and then in verse 25, God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and the livestock according to their kinds and everything that creeps in the ground according to its kind and God saw that it was good. So God creates plant and animal life within species, if that's the right word to use, that share similar genetic information and, um, and allows certain animals, therefore, and plants to be cross-bred and cross-pollinated. But in other cases, it's absolutely impossible for that to happen. You might have tulips beginning to pop up soon in your garden. They come in many beautiful different colors and shapes and sizes, in fact, and a little bit later in the year, you'll possibly have, you may, might have apple trees in the garden with a, a, a number of different varieties of apple because those have all been crossbred in different ways. But one thing you're not going to do is you're not going to take a tulip flower and crossbreed it with an apple tree. It's a different kind. Same with animals. There's a number of different breeds of cattle, as some of you farmers will know, with all their distinctive characteristics that can be crossbred the one with the other but you won't crossbreed a cow with a cat, will you? 
The point is that contrary to evolutionary theories that imagine that one form of animal somehow evolved into something quite different, that is, seems impossible. And the Bible account of creation has God creating different distinct species of animal that can, yes, reproduce themselves, that can, that can develop a, a variety of variants of different color and shape and size. So you get a great Dane and you get a Chihuahua. Both are dogs, but they're radically different in, in looks. But one species cannot become another, nor can different kinds reproduce something new. That's maybe enough to get your head around for, I think, this morning. And I promised somebody in the way in, I would stop earlier this morning because we had other things happening today. But next time, God willing, I do want us to begin to focus on the next part of this from verse 26 onwards. Because there it describes this aspect of creation that's all about you and me. Where God created something distinctly different from everything else. Something that's distinct even from other animal life, and that is humanity. We are not simply another animal. We are simply not that. We did not come from apes. We never, never did in any shape or form come from another animal. Because in the case of human beings, God doesn't just speak another life form into being. In this case, we are told that he, the triune God, specifically creates men and women in a, a very distinct way in his own image. And that's what sets humanity apart from everything else in a whole variety of ways. It is that image of God in us as humans that, yes, sin has marred very greatly, but it's that broken image of God in you and in me that God wants to deal with through the gospel because it's in, our, it's, it's in us with an image of God that's marred and broken. God wants to make a new creation that will restore what sin has damaged and they will ultimately give back to us what Adam and Eve lost in the Garden of Eden, which is the possibility of eternal life. That's what sin has taken from us. That's what Jesus Christ gives to us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful universe you have created and for its incredible complexity that we will never fully get our heads around but just for that knowledge that everything we see and know and experience in creation has come about by your command and by your very word and by your authority does creation even hold together much as the devil and his demons would want to destroy and disrupt this world we live in and bring and inflict any amount of pain and suffering we thank you for the knowledge that Christ is the one who has come and overcome the works of the devil. He is the one who will, who will make new people out of fallen, broken sinners. And he is the one who one day, the Bible tells us, will make a new heaven and a new earth, a new creation where sin and death will be no more and where everything in all its grand beauty will be restored. Thank you for that hope, Lord, that we have in the gospel of Jesus. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. We'll sing this hymn that talks about the darkness that was there and the light that God brings to it. All earth was dark until you spoke, and then all was light and all was peace. Let's sing it together.
grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us this day and until the glorious day that Jesus comes again, bringing in his new creation. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.